Hey everyone, this is Will. Welcome to Black in the Core. On this channel, we cover the best of black life and culture in New York City. My name is Michael Henry Adams. I am 67 years old. I came to New York from Akron, Ohio in 1985. And ultimately, in 1987, I um, started in the Historic Preservation Program at Columbia, which is the oldest historic preservation program in the United States. Having all sorts of frustrations about the Landmarks Preservation Commission and their um, lack of attention to uh, the built environment in Harlem. And when I had almost completed my um, thesis, um, which was about uh, houses and other buildings and how the buildings here were um, done in the latest, most fashionable styles of architecture, but translated from buildings built for rich people to buildings built for middle class and um, working class people. I decided that I would take that manuscript uh, from, for my thesis and then I would turn it into a book. And oh my gosh, I had the most horrible time trying to get someone to agree to publish this book. Finally, I remembered that um, when I first came to New York, I worked at the Scribner Bookstore. And this guy, John Franco Monticelli, who had been brought from Italy to run Scribner's, he, at that point, had a um, publishing firm called the Monticelli Press. So I called him up and I said what I wanted to do, and he said, we'll do it. And uh, I think he even told me on the phone um, the advance he would give me. I think he said something like, you know, $4,500. And I thought that was a lot of money. I soon realized it wasn't. But anyhow, um, so my book happened, and it was a kind of labor of love, and and there are always these setbacks that happen over and over again. And yet, what I learned was that each setback turned out to be a blessing in disguise because in the meantime, I would find some collection of photographs, which I hadn't known about before, um, that were just you know essential to have in the book. Um, and then uh, I found these photographs at the Museum of the City of New York, these um, postcard views that were done by this man named Thaddeus Wilkerson. And uh, I said, oh, we must have these. And I said, they're going to cost like, um, uh, I said, I don't know what they're going to cost. And he said, but the publisher, in accordance with that contract, was responsible for any illustrations for the book, paying for the rights. And he said, well, I'll do that, but only on condition that you give up the last $3,000 payment of your um, advance that we owe you when the manuscript is complete. And at first I thought, oh, hell no. But then I realized I wanted this book to be done so badly. And part of the reason why I wanted it to be done was because I thought, if I can do this book to show all of the beautiful buildings that have already been lost, and all those that survive and are now threatened, surely the Landmarks Preservation Commission will pay attention and do more in Harlem. They didn't. They didn't even though I did an exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York called um, Harlem Lost and Found. And from all I could see, it didn't make any difference whatsoever. Uh, when the Landmarks Preservation Commission had their uh, 30th anniversary of their founding, they um, had a symposium at the Museum of the City of New York, and they uh, had these various panels, and there were a couple of black people on panels. One was uh, Mary Schmidt Campbell, who had lived in Harlem. But she, her function on the panel she was on was simply to introduce the white panelists. She didn't say anything about anything. Except, she said, I live in a landmark house. And I said, oh, good for you. So um, I was livid. And uh, so I got up and I said, here we are just blocks away from Harlem, which is being destroyed daily bit by bit, and you all have not mentioned a word about it. Nothing. 
And what's more, you don't have any black people on any of your panels. What, what is this about? So Bob Stern, uh, Robert A.M. Stern, uh, the architect who I knew, he'd been one of my professors at Columbia, he said, um, he yelled out, he says, oh, Michael, you know that um, preservation of Harlem is all about politics. I said, Bob, you told us that everything in life was about politics. So you're telling me that it's all right to indulge in politics downtown, but not in Harlem? Uh, and then they had this guy who um, was the head of the New York Historical Society on one panel, Jackson, something other Jackson was his name. And he um, was talking about how the reason why there was ins an insufficient amount of uh, affordable housing in New York was because rents were regulated so um, stringently that um, developers simply could not afford to build the affordable housing we needed. And I said, well, what about in the 1890s? There was no rent regulation then, but there was lot, plenty of homelessness. And I said, and what about um, Cambridge and Boston, where with the promise that developers would create more affordable housing and that it would be more affordable than any housing that existed then, um, they um, repealed the rent stabilization law. And what happened? There was a flurry of building, but not one of those new buildings was uh, for working class people. Uh, they, were, they were all for um, well-to-do people. And uh, that's true in Harlem, by and large. Although there is one spectacular example of preservation. This school, PS 107, I think, on 145th Street, it was a ruin for years and had trees growing out of the roof and vines growing through the windows. And uh, some developer got that building and uh, restored it, made it into 100% low-income housing with a little part of it isolated to become the headquarters for the um, Harlem Boys and Girls Club. He used the preservation tax credit and, and he said, you know, he, he did it in a profitable way. And I think, well, why can't that be done all the time? There's a little movie that's being made about my life and work by this uh, um, Canadian named uh, Malcolm St. Pierre. And uh, in it, he interviews um, Ruth Messenger, um, who was the borough president of New York at the time that there was the controversy about whether or not Columbia would demolish the Audubon Ballroom and Theater. And she discovered that as borough pre Manhattan borough president, that she controlled any city funding that would go on that project. And she said that unless they pr at least preserved the facade, that she was not going to turn that money over. And oh my God, they let her have it. Every editorial board, every newspaper, the nasty, horrible, terrible things they said. It has been um, a lot of frustration living in a changing Harlem. We used to say, when I first moved here, my friends and I who were uh, African American, we would say to each other, oh my gosh, I can't wait for Harlem to come to be the place that we always dreamed it could be. And then in the next breath we would say, but I hope that it doesn't then become so expensive we can't afford to live here. We got um, Christian, this, this, this latest council member, who people speculate isn't running again because when she opposed um, the two double tower apartment building, 145, um, she was just excoriated in the papers. Despite their lie about you know affordable housing, which is affordable for whom? So then, you know, the guy, when uh, the community board and the council thwarted his effort, he had already torn down Al Sharpton's headquarters, and he said, well, if you won't let me build my tower, I'm going to put a um, truck depot here. A truck depot in the um, demographic in the city that has 
the highest asthma rate that there is. So I said, why doesn't the city and the state, why don't they together declare that this site that he has the truck depot on is blighted? They took restaurants and um, storage warehouses and apartment buildings, all kinds of viable buildings which were doing just fine um, in Manhattanville, and they called them blighted and tore them down so that Columbia can expand. Why can't they um, take that parcel by eminent domain and then, since they spend so much money in hotels and all this craziness to house homeless people and to house uh, um, um, migrants from uh, south of the border, why can't they just build a 100% affordable housing building for working class people? Uh, but moreover, the thing that I just don't understand uh, is that even if the affordable units in this, these two new towers were going to be as affordable as they say they are, the building still will be primarily made up of apartments that are purchased by um, well-to-do white people. And so in addition to that exacerbating the gentrification we already have, what that does that's really so insidious is that it undermines the black voting strength of Harlem and our community. And it won't be long before um, people will be electing a white city council member to represent Harlem. And I say not very long um, because it probably will take a while for Harlem to be half white still, but it doesn't have to become half white because white people who have more money and own property, they vote at a far higher rate than poor black people who own nothing. And do the um, politicians, do they think that uh, these white people are going to elect them to represent them? Do the black churches, which um, allow their churches to be demolished and take million dollar kickbacks from the developer, or worse, take a million dollars from the developer, which they then use to pay for the architectural drawings for the developer's apartment project. Do they really think that those white people are going to go to their church? They can't even get black people to go to their church, so they're not going to get any white people to go to their church. I struggle with this because I don't want to uh, seem to be racist or bigoted, um, but I think wanting for there to be some guaranteed place in Manhattan for myself, I don't think that that's uh, racist or bigoted, it's just self-preservation. Be a part of the conversation, comment below, and please subscribe to my channel for future videos on New York City, and hit the notification bell to receive more updates.